Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, good to be with you again um, on this Thursday. Now, uh, I was just told that this is the first time that I that there've been it's been a Thursday thing. I normally do the, the Tuesdays, but I know there's a Tuesday and Friday cadence, and now we're doing Thursdays. So uh, hopefully uh, your Thursday went pretty well. Um, I was thinking about what to like teach, what to talk about um, in the world of chess and. I was actually decided I wanted to put some emphasis on a player that like is kind of recently getting some love, but like has been good for a very long time now. Um, and it's weird to say that for someone that's so young, but Richard Rapport has been really, but uh, as I was saying, someone that just hasn't, has been around actually for like a decade now, it's pretty wild and has been showing this type of brilliance for a long time, but is now finally starting to get the recognition for it is Richard Rapport. Um, Richard Rapport now broke into the top 10 in the world. He'd kind of been hovering around the top 10 in the world, um, but I believe he broke through it in this Norway chess event that's not even over yet. Um, and it's a bit, it's a little bit unfortunate because, um, you know, he actually didn't have his best day today and he actually lost to Carlson yesterday, but he's still playing a great tournament. And I could spend time going over games and so on that he played in the Norway chess because he's shown this uh, really high level but he's been one of the most creative players for a long time and he's certainly one of the most creative players um, of this generation and um, what I wanted to show is basically how he wins games as you well know um, nowadays everyone has access to engines and uh, and database and so on. And getting a winning advantage out of the opening now is pretty unrealistic. Um, how many people actually get winning advantages out of the opening? Very few, um, because it requires cooperation. It takes two to tango. And so because of that, you actually have to play in more than one phase of the game at a very high level. And one of the things I've come to notice with uh, strong players for a long time, but is, but especially with the really good players today, is Carlson isn't the only one with really great technical skill. Now, he might be one of the, he might still be the best grinder in the world, but there are other players like Artemiev is someone that comes to mind, Vladislav Artemiev, Richard Rapport comes to mind, people that are very tricky tactically, but have a keen eye for technician. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a series of game fragments where that technician is on display and you can, what, what I'm going to want you to look for is see how this, these technical transitions um, or this technical skill set gives them the ability to win. And so actually, maybe I, fr I actually frame that a little bit poorly. I'm going to try again. What I want you to catch during the games is how there's some tactical skirmish or there's some uh, transition that gets them to a technical position they feel very confident about. So that's what we're going to be paying attention to in these games. Now, all these games are not from Norway chess. I pulled these games from the past three or four years, mainly basically before the pandemic. So it's, it's crazy to say that um, before pandemic, but, uh, but uh, we're, we're talking maybe like 2019, 2016 to 2019. And this first game is going to uh, be in that realm as well. So Anyway, this first game is between Richard Rapport and someone else you may have heard of, David Howell, uh, English grandmaster, who's uh, pretty well known, um, doing a lot of commentary lately. Um, and let's take a look. So Richard Rapport, and by, oh, one other thing I should say is we're looking just at white games. Um, you, could, you could spend time looking at his black games and getting a sense of what he's like, what he likes to do in those types of positions. But we're looking at white games because I think you'll be able to identify a trend in a lot of these games. And that's what I also want to talk about as we move forward today. So anyway, so D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, have a Fianchetto Grunfeld. Again, we're not going to spend too much time in the opening. We just are going to take a look at how white extracts from the, how Richard extracts something from the, from different positions. So C6 Grunfeld, very difficult to get a solid advantage against. A lot of people are playing this way. These symmetrical Grunfeld positions are very, very solid. And it's just interesting to see how Richard gets something out of it. So anyway, we have queen, an early queen B3, early queen B6, rook D8. And I actually recall myself 
banging my head against the wall in these bishops with white and look at some of the creativity here. So first bishop d2, not a really crazy move, but connects the rooks, keeps the tension. Bishop e6, and now knight a4. Very, very interesting position. Um, now white took on b3, uh, and after a takes b3, played knight a6. Just as a quick question, what happens if black played a move like h6? I know we're a smaller, smaller party today, but uh, I'm sure someone can uh, can give me this one. What, what, why, what, what about h6? Why, why wasn't that played? There we go. Yeah, yeah. Charles, Charles, you want to speak to that directly? Tell the tell the everyone else. Sorry, I don't I don't hear you, but uh, but uh, uh yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, knight b six uh, just wins the rook. Right. So knight b six, kind of an elementary uh tactic. Um, but also very subtle. If you weren't thinking about it from a few moves back, the point is that you know as soon as many many situations where the when you have this tension on the on the b file with queens I, I always would call this the queen b3 queen b6 dilemma because you see this a lot in in slavs and some grunfeld type positions with slav structures like like this one like this 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 pawn structure here a lot of times the double pawns are actually not such a big deal because of the counterplay on the a file so kind of out of nowhere you have this knight b6 threat and because of that it makes black make difficult decisions because you have to deal with that so uh black decided to play knight a6 and uh knight a6 is a is actually not a terrible move but this is not the place you want to put your knight because at the end of the day there's still going to be pressure on the a file now even with the knight uh because the knight is there instead of like a pawn or something and uh tactically that might be a little bit of a concern so Richard has already extracted a tiny concession, forcing the knight to a a6. Um, okay, so uh, knight a6, rook c1, knight e4, bishop b a5. A, a very oh, another very very good move. You might say, well, what what's which bishop on a5 doing? Okay, I'm stepping out of the uh, knight takes d2, giving up the bishop pair. But why bishop a5? Why not bishop e1? Well, the point is again to be provocative. So. How it played rook c8, but why wasn't b6 played? Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Why why wasn't why wasn't b6 played? All right, well, basically b6 wasn't played just because the knight on a6 is now extremely weak. So uh just tactically, it's it's gonna be a bad idea. I don't believe there's a direct capture on, on b6 that'll win the game right away. But even now, just bishop e1, the knight is going to be very vulnerable there. And not only has the, the knight been weakened because of the b6 move, the c6 pawn is also extremely soft. So these types Mine, of... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I just I just wanted to check uh, if we could take on b6. I was kind of curious. Yeah, yeah. So b6, so uh, what direction... Like bishop takes. Bishop takes, yeah, bishop takes. I mean, I agree, bishop e1 is fine. I was just... Oh, maybe black can just play knight c7 and like yeah. try to play that position. Yeah, I mean, that position, I think white would have very decent yeah. chances to shake the shake the tree. Um, so I agree. Speak. So I would probably go rook c7 and, and uh, rook a7 and hold my breath just because- Yeah, my plan was just rook a5, rook a1. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was, yeah, I mean, it, it could be, it could be very unpleasant then maybe even bishop f1. Um, yeah, no, I was thinking something along the lines like rook, like rook b8 potentially, um, but if you get in c5, maybe it's just working. And then you just can't kind of anchor and you keep the pin. Um, that was um, the plan. Sorry? That was the plan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you yeah, know, so it's tremendously unpleasant. I mean, uh, one thing though, is I would be a little worried about knight c5 if it works. Yeah, we, we could. And, and then put like, the rook in a3 instead of a5. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was just thinking that. Just no tricks. Yeah, yeah no tricks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty serious. I mean, and no doubt about it. Um, uh, but also, just bishop e1 is positionally good. So there's two two dangerous things happening, right? Yeah, I mean, if you didn't want to calculate, which. Uh, we could we could probably we could see my bias on full display a little bit. Um, 
there was go there was going to be massive problems even after a simple move like Bishop B1 because of the the weaknesses there. But yes, I honestly the direct approach might also work. I would be mildly concerned about like the knight c7 giving some counterplay, but white's probably better even there. Um, so, um, but yeah, but okay, just extracting a little some 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 there, right? So after bishop a5, rook c8, e3, g5. Okay, this move you can kind of question. I think the intent it's a little bit too superficial. Um, Hal was trying to argue. Okay, if I get in g4, I clamp. Uh, uh, White's king side, per, or particularly uh, f2 and h3, and uh, that that I take I take some space on the king side, and that's going to be enough to kind of offset some of the queen side issues. A little bit superficial because I don't think he truly understood how much pressure there really was um, connected to moves like bishop f1 and moving the knight away, and the pressure on the queen side with the nine a6 is going to be a problem. Um, but look at the transformation here because this is kind of what I want to. Take, take stock in and, and notice because you see over and over in Richard's games combined with these strange moves where you're like, wait, what? Wow, he did that. That looks really cool. So, all right, so knight d2, knight takes, bishop takes, g4, Howells focused on this king side space grab, bishop f1. And after bishop f1, Howells basically had enough. He said, you know what? Like there's too much pressure going on the queen side. I might be worried about bishop takes a6. I might be worried about um, c5. And those concerns are forcing me to release the tension, right? This is a major, major, major concession, but it's the product of some of this maneuvering pressure that Richard has basically been trying to get over the course of the past 10 moves. Um, now, if I was Howell, just to be fair, I don't think bishop takes a6 would be something that I'd be really worried about because just like the double B pawns weren't the real issue, it's really the piece play. And so if I was able to get uh, White's bishop off the board, even at the cost of ruining my pawns, that wouldn't really be what I'd be concerned about. So if I, so yeah, so if I had to, if I had to guess, I, I would suspect that um, maybe he was more concerned about some combination of B4, B5 potentially happening. Um, but even then, I would have waited and played knight c7 um, after c5 and, and then tried to play a6 and built that kind of barrier uh, rather than play it the I, way that he played it. I have a question again. Isn't, yeah. it, isn't it more that White's just going to win some pawns, like just take on d5, take on a6, knight c5, and then... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's know, definitely the trouble. strategy. But yeah. uh, to be honest, I think that position, Black's going to have much, much better chances because... If you give up the a6 pawn and and maneuver your bishop to e4, there's going to be pretty there's going to be potential for some decent counterplay just because the light scores are so weak. So if we said like let's just say for argument's sake like uh, uh, let's say h5 just for argument's sake like c5. No, no, I was going to force. Sorry. I was just going to take on d5. Sorry, yeah, yeah. C, takes d5. That's what I want to do. I'm um, greedy. And then c d5 and then bishop a6 right. Take, sure. And and then knight c5 right. Well, sure. this particular scenario after bishop f5, I think offers black really, really good chances to hold because oh, black can go I, e6, bishop f8. Um, these Again, these light scores are very, very weak. Um, so I would actually take my chances here than oh, in releasing the tension every time. I'm still like, what are you going to do with the a7 pawn? So, so what is your next move? I guess I'll take work a6. Okay. And let's say I go e5. Sure, let's say bishop c3. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, bishop f8. Um, you know, just go b4, rook a1. It feels... You know, it definitely, I, I would, I think this honestly gives better chances than the positions where you just release okay. the tension. Like it's, it's really, cause you're giving up so much there. I, I don't, I, I have no doubt. I agree. Yeah. The positional grip here, but black has chances with the bishops. Black always has chances with the bishops. It seems. Um, so yeah. Okay. Like, let's say I started with like, uh, actually maybe instead of playing E5 right away, now I like e5. Bishop c3, let maybe I say 
bishop. Actually, I didn't. Maybe I start with bishop f8 instead. I mean, I suppose just rook a1. Mm -hmm. And then e5 here. Probably b4. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take on d4. Yeah. And then go rook e8. Uh, probably bishop e3. And then rook b8. Because I'm, I'm scared of things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, this, rook you, your light you know, squares yes. are really weak. Really weak. It's true. I'm going to try and stop you from getting in there. But like yeah. rook a4, bishop c2. B3. Oh, but yeah, you can bishop take c5. Him. Sure, sure. Yeah, you get some play. Like, even if you win the a-pawn for free, which is a big if in this particular circumstance, there you've given up so much activity and that black is going to have chances. And the king is not... The king is a little weak, I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, but, okay. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, point taken, white's position is to be preferred pretty much a bit everywhere, but you release the tension with d takes 4 you're really giving up a ton. And one thing to point out is there are a lot of positions, it doesn't actually happen in this game, where uh, I've seen rook takes a6 as a really, really nice exchange sacrifice. Um, you have these just like rook a6, b a6, plant the knight on c5. And there's like a really awesome grip where you can, if you get at least one pawn, um, maybe <laughs> somewhere you get another pawn and then you mobilize the queen side majority. Black is, is just like a wrap. Like black has very limited counterplay, basically. Um, so um, it is remarkable how giving up the tension gives this much, but it really does. Um, so anyway, so D takes E4, B takes E4. Um, so the, the technical advantage or transition that's already kind of happened based upon you know, this, this, the last skirmish of the ten, uh, last 10 moves is what I was going to ask. And uh, I kind of answered this one, so I'm gonna just take it all the way, is the pawn structure and the space. So getting slightly more, uh, slightly more, or actually significantly more space now because of DC4, BC4, and uh, kind of the, the healthy nature of white's pawn structure makes this like, a dream position for white to play. And this is when like, again, when, when a player like Richard has extracted that technical advantage, the creativity can really shine. And um, I, again, I don't want to go through this entire game, but I, I just want to take stock of now we're in a, like a, now we've got the technical advantage we want, watch him work. And it's really nice to watch Richard work. So, all right, so C5 desperately trying to create some space um, yeah, not ideal, but Bishop G2, excellent move. I, not a move that I think most people would play. I think most people would, would really consider playing D5 and taking the space. I'm not sure a ton of people would play Bishop G2 right away, but of course it's the best move. Um, uh, you're, you're threatening the, uh, the B7 pawn and that's a huge problem. Rook B8 defending now D5, uh, taking space, Bishop D7. And bishop c3, another not, I mean, not a completely obvious move. I think uh, a lot of people might consider just rolling their majority and keeping and keeping the keeping those bishops on the board, particularly when you see a rook on b8. So I could see a lot of people saying, oh no, 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 I'm gonna go e4 and bishop f4 and advance in that particular way, also forcing the rook back. But one of the things uh, that you know alpha zero and computers made very, very apparent in the last five years or so um, is trading your opponent's active uh, active pieces away. Um, and frankly, the bishop on g7 is the best piece that black has. So you get rid of it and you're left with a bunch of really passive pieces. So it's actually a really excellent exchange. Um, so yeah, so bishop c3, bishop takes a4 is played, rook takes. Rook d8, h3, clearing out that space disadvantage that uh, that white had, uh, or on the king side, uh, pawn takes h3, bishop takes h3, rook d6. 
And here, I mean, it was like, there's like a series of maneuver maneuvers that I thought was just really, really fantastic. And this is why the game kind of like leapt off the screen for me. Cause it seems like it's just one way traffic and to a certain extent it is. But when you see these transitions, you kind of like your jaw drops a little bit just cause it's really cool. Um, so E4 trying to take space in the center. Bishop takes E3, Rook takes E3 and Rook B6. B3 just to cover that pawn, E5. And here, I'm gonna pose the question to you. It seems like black is trying to get some dark square stability in the position. E5 was just played. Um, how would you as white handle, handle this one? How would you handle the next several moves? It's clear that you have an advantage and uh, with space advantage, you have the better minor piece, your structure is healthier now, but how would you handle this one? Jed, can can you uh, can you tell me what your thing be a little more specific? Um, there? Uh, right. um, so I was thinking um, maybe bring uh, the I'm king. Sorry, I'm, I'm I was thinking maybe bring the king up to uh, that stop. I have to answer my question. <laughs> uh, I was thinking maybe bring a, bring my king up to uh, f five or h five. So, uh, and and to what to what end? So your idea is to bring the king to f five, and what are you going to do when you get there? Um, well, I, well, that provokes something like F6 or um, some form of defense like F6. And then um, I'm not sure. I mean, you've definitely weakened the dark squares a lot. So, you, so there's several ideas. Number one, bring the bishop to E6. Um, number two, bring the rook on A4 around to G1 and play G4, G5 to undermine E5. Mm. But, like, it opens up, it opens up, the king's activity opens up a whole window of possibilities for white. So, yeah. See, yeah, I actually, I mean, let's, let's play a few moves just to kind of tease that out. So if you go King G2, uh, let's just say I go King G7. King F3, I guess. Uh-huh. And let's say I go H5. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a bit annoying. Okay. Um. Well, now I can play Bishop F5 with the idea of Rook A1, Rook H1. I like that. I, I really do. I like that. That's, that's an interesting idea. Um. Uh, I might, I might try something like, I might try to break with H4. If oh, I go um, H4, do you, tr are you going to, I mean, you can probably take H4 now and then go King G4 and Rook no, H3. Yeah. No, but, but I, you saying Rook H8, uh, yeah. you saying Rook H8, yeah, uh, that's a bit annoying. But question uh, but, for you, question oh, wait, for you. Know, yeah, do I have Rook A1? Do I have Rook A1 idea, uh, H4 is not, because yeah, if you get a bucket, that's a bit annoying. Question for you though, if if white if black plays h4, do you want to trade or do you or do you want to play g4? Um, I well, if um if I if g4 with g5 happens, then I feel like I feel like it might be a good inclusion. But if black gets to put his king on g5, then I don't think it is. I completely agree. I completely agree. Yeah, and no, this is definitely not a good idea because of the knight. Yeah, because of the pawn structure. So if h4, I think I'd like to. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. But that, that was a, a really legit idea, though, trying to activate that king. You're getting at those weak squares. Uh, it, make, it makes some sense. Uh, I'm going to mute you there just because I heard a little bit there in the background. Um, but that, that made some sense. That really did make some sense. Um, any other idea? Greg, Greg included in that. Sorry, I'm cooking. I'm just trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made dinner before this. I like Jed's idea. Very positional. Yeah, no, I mean that I, that idea I uh, um I was a, attracted to uh, as well. I think it might be a timing issue. All right, so let's take a look. So uh, Richard started with Rook F three. Uh, I think this is a great move because we're talking about situations where we provoke F six. And uh, Jed was a saying we get the we get the we get the king f five we broke f six. Well, that took a lot of time, and getting the king f five was challenging. But f six is definitely a provocation we'd like. Um, so uh, by going by going rook f three quicker, we provoke f six. We prevent the rook on b six from interacting with the the king side. So rook f five rook f three is a great move. King g seven was played. 
And now Rook A5, very, very subtle move, I think. Very subtle move. Um, but just freezing this knight. So we're, we, we certainly intend Rook, F, Rook F5 in some positions, but we basically are just improving slightly. So now this knight is frozen because C5 and potentially A7 are problems. And um, it's just one of those small creeper moves that's very subtle. H6 now. This is kind of like, uh, this is one of those moves which is like, a, show me what you're going to do. Show me type of move because I don't have anything. Because uh, H6 really is, is like a kind of unfortunate pass. And Richard is going to show us. Bishop D7. So we like provoke, we liked the potential of kind of provoking F6, but with rook eight, what the combination of rook A5 and bishop D7 do is they allow us to completely shift gears and take terrain on the other side of the board. And th this move was really attractive to me. Rook D6, bishop B5. Now there's a threat of bishop A6, rook takes E5. And those connected passers are going to be a problem. So knight c7. How would you handle this one with white? How many, how many would take the pawn? How many would do something else? Eric, speak to me. Talk to me. So I would take... Because if like knight takes b5, I will take with the pawn. And if he goes rook b6, I can go rook a5. So are you concerned at all about that rook on a5 being stuck or not really? Uh, not really, because I'll be targeting the c5 pawn with rook c3. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So you would you take and you go, uh, you go. Yeah, but then, but if your two works are busy, then what are you going to do to improve your position? That's the thing. I feel oh, like well, after that, then I could walk my king to maybe a four or c four to protect the b five pawn mm. and my rook. All right, let's take a look at that. So, so rook takes a seven, knight takes b five, c takes b five, rook b six, rook. No, a but yeah. And you're saying you're gonna move, you're gonna play rook. You're, I guess, black is gonna. It is hard to be. Yes, black. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, white has the idea of walking the king to c4. But what if I play rook c8? Like, yeah, I, I go rook c8. And then I'll go rook c3. Okay. Yeah, you saw c4. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Maybe this works. Um. I just ah. Uh, um. Um, could I go? Yeah, I'll go king f8, yeah. King I think... f8, I'll go king f1. King e7. King e2. Yeah, okay, king d6, I mean, oh, wait, 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 yeah, king d6, I guess. King d6, king d3. Yeah, hmm, yeah, I don't see... I don't see what to do for black right here. Maybe I could create some counterplay here. Uh, okay, what if I do something like h5? Yeah, I, I'm gonna stop you. Should we go I'm back gonna, a little bit? Yeah, yeah I'm gonna <laughs> stop you here. Yeah, because I, I like this analysis and I think um, I think it's, white is definitely uh, pressing here, but I think you do give black some chances. Yeah. Um, I will say that if you, um, uh, I will say that if you, I think in this variation that you guys were looking at, I think it would have behooved black to start with H5 much sooner because I think and to get any type of hope, if you just kind of walk into the defensive posture, you're not going to be able to hold it because white has too many active plans like rook F3 back if the king gets to C4, F4 um, and so on. But I think if black trying to go like H5, F5, uh, I think that would have been tough um, to, uh, I think that would have been a way uh, for black to uh, fight. And I also don't think the rook on b6 staying here forever is going to be the way to hold this. Because again, it, the rooks may or may not offset each other, but I think the, the point is maybe that the rook can do a cer certain active duty with on the f of the g file in conjunction with h5. And then if the rook on a 
on A5 moves away than going back to B6. And I think that's where there may be some annoyance with uh, that makes it somewhat uh, difficult for, uh, uh, for, for white to win. But um, Richard took a different path. And I think it's uh, frankly the easier path and he just played Bishop A4. Um, and why is that the easier path? Well, you have a C7 pawn that's attacked and an A5 pawn that's attacked. Why not keep that pressure on when you also have the better minor piece? This knight on C7 is really lacking scope. And um, why not keep those minor pieces on? Um, Howell played knight A6 back. And uh, I, I just absolutely love the sequence here. Rook F5. So we everything's kind of coming together. The rook, the, we shifted with this rook to f3 with this intent to go rook f5. We teased it for a while. Now we finally play it, and, and black goes f6. And now f4. And everything is kind of in a bind. Still, we have this rook on d6 that's, I mean, it was on b6 before, but it's terrible here. e5 is under pressure. The bishop on a4 is really supporting quite ex excellently uh, a, a, a bum rush to the center, a pawn rush to the center. And the rook can't even play, go to e8 and kind of contain that. So the bishop is doing an incredible job on this square. Um, it means you have to release the tension with e takes f4. And after g takes f4, e5 is just a killer. King g6 was played to thwart the e5 move because now the rook, funnily enough, is. Wait, by the way, isn't back in the. Um... Oh, never mind. I was gonna say black would always be like a zip on in, in a position. Yeah, and oh, I can't it move. I can't way. move. Yeah. Yeah, it flew oh, yeah. that way. Yeah. But here's the here, here. But basically, all these ex, 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 things that have been extracted over the past few moves, it's like it's like this pressure from both sides, constant pressure from both sides. And then finally, this is kind of the. Oh, the, rook the f6. Draw. Is, is rook f6 a move? Oh wait, no. Uh, yeah, rook f6. Rook f6. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Yeah. Um, uh, here we go. B4. Oh, yeah. Oh. And Bishop C2. Oh, my God. And this basically just undo, un, undresses the position because you have C5 now all coming. the pawns go forward. Yeah, you have C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, and Bishop C2 maneuver at some point. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, you're even going to secure a pawn somewhere here. And, uh, I mean, just a tour de force in terms of demonstration. I mean, now knight takes is pretty much forced. I mean, if you go C before, there's C5 even. I mean, yeah, the bishop's coming to C2 also. Um, it's not pretty. Um, but knight takes before, and now bishop D1. So he's like, you know what, C5, I mean, yeah, I could take that when I want to, but now I have this bishop D1 idea and can dominate from the other side. And after knight A6 back, Bishop h5, king h7, e5. And uh, the rook even came to b5 to neutralize the one active piece that black had, the rook on b6. And after some moves, I think we could, everyone can acknowledge here that even though black is a, a pawn up, that hardly tells the story of the game. But it's that kind of creative really creative maneuvering um, that is like, whoa, that is so cool. Um, and so I just wanna, I mean, the game for all intents and purposes is, is over here. I mean, I can show you just a mop-up job, just collecting all the pawns and then black finally resigned here. But let's just take stock of where that Bishop came from and where it landed just for a moment again. So we were here, the Bishop was on H3 and we were like, okay, this is pretty good. This White has more space. Black is trying to establish some dark score setup, and then e5 was played. And then look at this trip. Bishop to d7, bishop to b5, bishop to a4, bishop to d1, bishop to h5. That is a, a full range piece. That is that is uh, circling the rounding the bases, so to speak, um, right in baseball, right. So again, just very very good technical. Uh, ability, creative technical ability that is was based on the fundamental pre uh, premise of I have more space and I'm going to needle with that space. It happens time and time again in Richard's games. Um, so let's go to another one. Okay. 
All right, so uh, this was a game in 2019 at Dortmund, uh, the famous uh, tournament that takes place in Germany. Um, obviously, Jan is uh, a, a stronger player uh, now than he was then, but still very, very good. And again, Richard has been a, at this level for a long time. It, I've always, I've talked to you know people to pe- people that follow chess and been like, yeah, this dude is really good. He just hasn't been getting as many opportunities as some of the other players. This was someone that actually considered retiring a few years ago because he was like, I'm, I'm, I don't I don't feel like I'm getting the opportunities. And so on. I was like, I was, I, it was heartbreaking. This dude's like 2740 knocking on the door and he's like thinking about retiring. I was like, dude, what are you doing? Um, but anyways, let's take a look. So I'm going to zip past the opening as in the previous game. And what I want to ask you is what ad- advantage has white extracted or what is white? Yeah. What, what, what advantage has white extracted? So again, a little bit of Richard creativity that we have an exchange on D5 and Bishop G5. Um, just a little, a little tactical skirmish there. Um, but it matters. Uh, H6 G5, queen takes. Jan did not want to trade queens. Uh, he likes to keep things tension on the board. And we're going to take a pause right here because this is a position that's equal material. Um, you could even argue that black has a little bit more space. But what has white extracted here that makes this a technical type of game? And before you, before anyone answers, just I want to just give you like 20, 20 seconds to think about it, just to make sure uh, other people might have a chance. So just think about it for like 20 seconds. Like, what four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to catch you there. Just wait, wait one moment, one moment. Yeah, feel free to mute when people. Um... All right, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know how this works. All right. Okay, can I? Hold on, hold on. Know what I'd do. Change my mind. Hmm. All right. Uh, I'll start with I'll start with Jed. Jed, where, where, what is again? I'm not even asking you for moves necessarily. I'm just asking yeah. you what advantages does White have? Uh, White has a better bishop. But um, like we can, well, we can see that the bishop on c3 first of all is restricted by b4 and e5 pawns, and even hmm. though it looks so. Even though it looks all scary on C3, it really isn't doing much, and it doesn't have anywhere to go. Meanwhile, White could even like maneuver his bishop to C4 in certain c- circumstances. And it's just a much more active and and uh, much more active and full range piece. Right, I, I think that's fair to say. The better bishop. Uh, any other observations? Uh, his last pawn structure might be a bit overextended, and his king might be. Oh yeah, also his king's not very. Like the king's weaker because of his g5 pawn. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Ted now, uh, or excuse Ted. Excuse me, Timothy. I was thinking Jed, and then I was thinking T, and then I merged those and made Ted. Sorry, Timothy. Tell uh, tell me uh, what you uh, tell me what you're thinking. So I said that white has a slightly better pawn structure because like blacks has double pawns and they're slightly overextended and. Also, the king side pawns and the bishop are like, are like kind of good together. So the bishop can move. Yeah, around. yeah, that's a really great observation. I think um, you always want to think about you know uh, complementary chess. I mean, I think we use this term in in a lot of different sports. So you'll hear people in sports say complementary football. You know, it's like a team that passes the ball and runs the ball. They have run pass balance. You know, in chess, a lot of times you want your pawns to complement your bishop um, because one, the bishop can only control one set of squares. So you allow the pawns to do the other. And with black, black's bishop and pawns aren't complementing. White's bishop and pawns are. That makes a huge difference in opposite colored bishop positions, um, especially with heavy pieces on the board because it means you can manufacture chances. So it's a, it relates directly to the king safety issue. And that's a really great observation. Now, based upon that, now we're into, phase two of the question, how do you act on that? Because black trades a little bit more and then plays like G6 and King G7, then we can talk about 
you know, black exposition being kind of solid and the light squares being uh, better covered. So if you give black a few moves, we're pretty much going to be on even e equal-ish terms or more even terms than we are on now. So any, anyone have any direction here? All right, so I'm, I'm going to just acknowledge ideas here because there's not a ton of us. Uh, so Jed was saying bishop f1 with the idea of bishop d3, bishop c4. I like I like that a lot. Um, I think that's a pretty good idea. Okay, so rook d3 was played first. Um, this finesse is very, very important because... What happens in the next few moves is not possible if you if you play, or I believe it's much harder if you play bishop f1. Um, so we're going to take stock of this rook d3 move, and then we're going to go back and see why it was important or understand why it was important. g6, covering some of those light squares. Rook cd1, doubling on the d file. Not shifting the bishop over to f1, or to d3, f1 to c4 right away. Why is that? Rook takes d3, queen takes d3. Now the bishop can potentially even enter on this diagonal instead of having to circle back around. That's a nice time-saving mechanism uh, that you know, really does make a huge difference. And now white has the file in addition to having the, uh, the better bishop. King g7, again, Jan giving up on a6. a4. This is the huge difference. If you started with bishop f1 a few moves ago, a4 probably isn't happening because there'll be uh, rook takes d3, rook takes d3, you know, you could say a5. And with the rook, with a heavy piece not being attached to the bishop on c3, you don't get this a4 mechanism. And it's actually a huge deal to have the pawn on a2 instead of on a4. It's a really huge deal because... Uh, and that way, there's literally no target on the queen side because the eight pawn is, wouldn't be weak. And the bishop uh, on c4 would protect b3. So the difference between having a pawn on a2 and a pawn on a4 is a pretty big deal. And so by doubling, he gave, him that, gave himself that opportunity to remain attached to the, the bishop on c3 in both positions. And that little finesse actually means a lot because now this bishop is pretty much dead for the foreseeable future. I mean... At least in the pre in the other position, if black does not, if white does not get an a4, black might have this active idea of going a5, a4 themselves and getting a, a heavy piece behind the a pawn and potentially holding that. I understand the the uh, the bishop is controlling the a8 square, but you get the point that there could be some scenario where black actually sacks the pawn to get counterplay on the a file. Not going to happen if a4 is already included. So that that little transition is huge. And after a4, again, we're in a, in a type of position where that technical grind begins that is so unpleasant to play against. So uh, Jan is pretty helpless here. Queen f6, queen d7, a5, bishop e4, just a really nice cementing move there. Queen e6, we can trade, that's fine. Can I interest you in double isolated pawns? Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> That's one of the ugliest pawn structures I've seen in some time. Um, and then G4 to fix those pawns. Oof, terrible. Um, and then the maneuvering begins. The rook shifts to D7. The bishop will eventually shift to C4. And even a pawn sack and some activity doesn't make a huge difference. And ultimately, uh, you know, the E pawn just runs. Again, opposite colored bishop positions. You'll see this all the time now. Um, you know, computers have actually done a, I think I actually, I had a lesson about this for the US chess school. We spoke about this, that the, the computers have really demonstrated just how not drawish these opposite colored bishop positions are, even when the material is equal. It really is just coming down to which side has the initiative more. And if you have a pawn up and the, and the heavy piece are on the board, it's just it's just a nightmare because the it's like white is a piece up in, in many ways 
because it's about, you know, who's attacking, who's playing with the initiative more. And we've always known that, but I think the really big switch has been uh, how, how significant it is with respect to end games. So it's not just, it's not just with attacks that that's, that it's who's, who's attacking more or whatever. It's with, even with small initiatives that you find the opposite called Bishop is just, just traumatic scenarios for the defending side. So um, yeah, after some more maneuvering, ultimately Jan called it uh, a day and had enough and resigned here. So, but another really kind of masterclass in taking a little, little something, understanding the technical advantage and then using the using really, really powerful creativity to take advantage of it. I mean, we saw, you know, a moment ago that en passant, that again, not rushing to redeploy the bishop. I think I honestly was attracted to bishop f1 too, but not rushing to redeploy the bishop, understanding that uh, the queen could step out the way and, and the bishop could be activated and understanding the difference between having a2 and a4 um, on the board. Like, having the pawn a4 gives you much, much more winning chances than having the pawn on a2 would um, because there are no, ultimately no targets and that ultimately led to the rest of the game. Okay, I think we'll have time for one more example. Um, and uh, let me move to a game of uh, uh, Richards from the Bundesliga, uh, the, the German league and the Bundesliga. And Richard was playing Erwin Lamy, who if you are familiar with Erwin Lamy, he is the longtime second or coach of really, I mean, second coach, however you want it to call it, uh, of uh, Anish Giri. Um, and even before that, he actually helped Topolov work on his, uh, he, he did some work for Topolov uh, back in the day. So uh, very, very good uh, player, but also a good trainer in his own right. And knows what he's doing in the opening. So um, when you play someone like that, you also, it's always funny to see how they are kind of shaken off of their normal path. Uh, again, we're going to kind of zip through the opening. I want you to identify what advantage advantages or what types of technical advantages has Richard extracted. Okay, so knight f3, d5, g3. You have a uh, knight f3 business. E takes f3. Um, put that... Uh, Put that in your back pocket. Think about that move. Uh, again, a very creative looking move. Um, I, I've uh, I've seen it done before, but it's always it's always nice to see. F four d three. Some more space grabbed, and here we are. So what is white extracted in this position? What has white gotten out of this position thus far? I'll give it another 20, 30 seconds. Eric? Um, so I I feel like White might be able to start an attack since he already has a lot of space on the king side, and like the Black's queen is on the queen side. So. Right. So so White has White has more space. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe White could let go like what G four and G five at some point. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Any other advantage White has um, besides the space? The bishop pair. The bishop pair. Yeah, yeah. We'll always, we'll always acknowledge the the bishop pair. That's a pretty big one. Um, so those are pretty much the two advantages that White has extracted. Um, what about Black? I, I know we didn't ask that in the previous uh, games, but um, it's kind of always important to ask, like, what is Black? And this time it's more. Yeah, this time it's more about it's actually like Black has. Black has a healthier pawn structure. Black has, a, Black has a healthier pawn structure than the actual majority on the queen side. Right. 
And so this is actually one of these positions where um, it's actually really tricky to see whose stuff is going to matter more. Because I look at this position, uh, I even, you know flipped the board and looked at it for a little bit from Black's perspective, and I was like, I kind of like Black's position. I mean, if White's initiative that doesn't really seem like it's off the ground yet really hits home, um, or excuse me, if Black's, if, sorry, if White's initiative doesn't get off the ground, and it doesn't seem like it is, Black has great long-term prospects. Like Black has a healthy pawn structure. There's no pawn break on the queen side. There's access to the D4 square. And I'm sure Lamy's sense of danger kind of left him a little bit here because uh, he played a move that even I was thinking, you know, that, that looks like a decent move. I, I love the D4 square. I want to take advantage of the D4 square. And uh, Erwin played the move Bishop C5. And in typical Richard style, he kind of basically just makes you question your decision-making a little bit in a very, very impressive and decisive way um, uh, because Bishop C5 is not a good move. And, uh, and the reason it's not a good move um, is because actually D4 works. And it was really surprising just to see that because it's like, wait, wait, white is supposed to, black is supposed to have that square. Like black is putting a piece on that square. And I now, actually, could just, I actually was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. So basically they're, they're, it seems like it shouldn't work because there's so many different, there's different ways that black take, but none, none of the reasons, none of the captures work. So, uh, you know, knight takes D4, runs into B4. Uh, and then you also start to see, oh, this is why the king went to G2. Oh, that makes sense now. Now there's not a capture with check. Um, uh, so that doesn't work. A uh, bishop takes D4 doesn't work because of A4. And it's like, wait, wait, wow. This is like just a tempo loss that clearly Erwin didn't take into account. So after D4, uh, Bishop D6 was played. And if the if Black, if black is, uh, winds up training the dark squared bishops, there's no dynamic play for white because uh, there would be a you know, nice grip on F6. You'd betray another, another piece around uh, the white king. And again, we're, we're talking about a such a circumstance where black has the long-term trumps here. Um, so, uh, you know, if white doesn't really get something or extract something, then it's actually gonna be black that has this game in the long run. And I think that's also why it's interesting to see how white ultimately manages to get the long-term trumps in the next few moves. Uh, Richard starts with Bishop G5. So think, no, we're not gonna trade. And Bishop F8 was played. And, why was that played? Well, because if you play a move like h6, f6 is almost certainly going to be played. I mean, this is kind of, I think the point of the whole setup is that Richard is trying to extract lights, some more weaknesses in the king's in the in the in black's position. And the and the lines here are quite fanciful because uh the knight on d7 is protect is uh is protected and something like like rook, rook d8, there might even be something like f takes g7 that looks nice. There might be some knight g5, queen g5 business going on, queen h5 business going on, or knight takes g5, queen, d, queen d3, or queen c2 business going on, and some really lightning quick attack. So <laughs> Erwin was like, you know what? I'm not going to push any pawns in front of my king and, and, uh, and invite this type of stuff. But you can see here that if the intent was to was to go bishop f8 right away. Well, this was obviously a tremendous waste of time. This bishop d6, bishop f, bishop c5, bishop d6, bishop f8 maneuver. All right, h5, taking some more space. h6, not allowing white to play h6, but kind of double edged because of f6. Um, now, again, if you take on g5, the white bishop takes on d7. And all of a sudden, it seems like the, the, the Richard train has gotten, is starting to roll out of the station, right? There's uh, an initiative out of nowhere, it seems. Um, and you're pretty much obliged to take on F6. And now you have a circumstance where all of a sudden, a position where a second ago, we were like, well, Black has this, the better pawn structure and the better uh, long-term prospects. It's just flipped on its head. And again, from here, Richard can start to work his magic. Um, uh, knight d6, knight h4, establishing a grip on the f5 square. Rook e7, queen g4, getting another piece over the king side. Bishop g7, queen f4, shaking the knight from uh, d6. Queen c7, 
Bishop D3, again, excellent maneuvering now, saying, you know what, I want maybe a new piece on F5, um, and then this bishop really looks bad. Um, Queen D7, Bishop F5, we're repeating just to show who's boss, um, and then B4, then trying something else, expanding on the queen side. And you can see from the rest of the game, uh, which I'm zipping through somewhat quickly now, that really black was just responding to what white was doing. And it was extremely unpleasant to deal with. And it was all because of that little sequence in the opening that, you know, it's basically like, welcome to the torture chamber right now, because uh, white is just maneuvering incessantly, nonstop, it seems, to get to, uh, to get this grip that ultimately wins the game. And then all the good players today are excellent with tactics. So. Um, you can't, you know, show your positional might and then not see tactical blows. And knight d5 is one, is one such blow. Uh, if cd5, bishop b5 check just picks up the exchange. So uh, bishop d takes d4 is played. And uh, yeah, it's not, this is not a good position. Does anyone want to identify the knockout blow here for white? There's more than one, I think. It looks like there, there might be more than one. Timothy? Yeah, I think so. so the move is rook to c7 check. Uh-huh. And if king e8? Then bishop e5 check. Or what if I go king f6? Then... Uh, Timothy, I think, I think. I... Sorry, Timothy. Was this Timothy as the floor? Say it. Say it again, Timothy. If King F six, did you have something there? I didn't get it. Yet. Okay. You know these these. It's funny because your bishop is hanging too. So these. You got to be somewhat careful because these three on twos, these rook end games, three on two, usually drawn. So you got to be a little careful. Um, I think F6 is cleaner. And uh, this is what was played in the, the point is that you just force the king to a really unfortunate square um, where if, it, if they decide to hold on to the knight, they can't recapture the bishop because of mate. So if king F8, obviously rook takes D8 as mate, but king E8 does the same well, there's many ways here, but just even rook c8, I think, is just the easiest. Just threatening mate in one. Um, can't get out of that in any reasonable way. Um, so that would be a little bit easier. After f6, the king has to go this way, and then you keep your material together. And that's kind of the ball game. So, but yeah, I think we can all learn something from Richard's games. There, there's this, I, I see time and time again. I mean, we only saw three games today um, just because of the time constraint, but there are a few patterns that you'll see in the games. Um, and actually before I, actually, I was gonna say, before I actually offer my observations of like the patterns you saw in these games, does anyone want to identify patterns that they noticed? And I'll, I'll tell you my conclusions and we'll just finish with those. Any, any patterns in these games as far as ha what, what's happening what's happening out of the opening or, or through the middle game, wow, the transformations, what, what types of advantages are being, um, being extracted? Well, I remember on um, one of the examples, like when there was a rook on a5 and uh, he didn't take the free pawn on a7, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, he is trying to Sometimes he's playing dynamically, and sometimes he is playing strategically, and I think that's very good. Yeah, I think that's a really good observation. There's like this, like the ability to kind of sense the moment and switch like back and forth, back and forth, uh, depending upon what might be necessary. I think that's a very underrated skill is that, that switching, because a lot of people have this mindset, I'm going to play this way, and they play this way the whole game when there's might be a moment where they can play the other way. And then you could see, it's like you're fluent in different languages. He's able to switch so easily back and forth, back and forth 
uh, from strategic to dynamic play that makes it really nice. One of the things that I want to just point out is, an, and, and you'll see this in a lot of Richard games, is he's usually not playing E4. I told you not to focus on the openings, but he's usually playing something like D4, Knight F3 that has like a more uh, closed nature to the game where he can be, afford to be a little bit more creative. And then what happens is he just tries to get some type of strategic advantage that he can justify playing creatively on. So see, sometimes it's he'll get a bishop pair, or sometimes there'll be more space, or sometimes there'll be a slightly better pawn structure. And once he has one of those things, he's able to really, really do a lot of creative stuff with it. So I think that's something to look for when you see these really amazing games from him and even look at his games now in the future is see like, what does he have here? And why, what is he working with that can enable him to play in this way? Because if there was no advantage or there was no dynamic, if there was no strategic or dynamic advantage, he wouldn't be able to be as creative because it wouldn't be a good, it wouldn't be good to do that. But once he has that advantage, he's can, it's, he can show his creativity. And so it's important to identify what does he have? And um, you'll see that over and over again, it's a small positional advantage that turns into something really cool. Uh, one more thing, a comparison, just a, uh, like a, he's, this is, he is basically just a player comparison. Cause sometimes people like that. Richard Rapport is a modern day Alexander Morozovic. Now, many of you here have probably have not looked at, uh, uh, many Morozovic games, but Morozovic played the same way. So if you want to see someone that's equally creative and had a lot of that in him, these really weird moves that was like, wow, that's really cool. Look at some of Alexander Morozovich's games. Really a, a fun, fun, fun thing to do. So anyways, uh, that is it for me. And um, yeah, hope, hope you uh, hope you take a, take a peek at some of Richard's games going forward.